Krásné dobré odpoledne, ahoj! Tak jsme tady dneska, já už jsem měla to štěstí, byla jsem na ambasádě, všechno jsem pro vás vyzjistila, protože dneska dochází k jedné z nejhistoričtějších událostí naší země a to je to, že jsme součástí obrovského hnutí, celosvětového hnutí, Save Soil, neboli Zachraňme půdu. A jsem ráda, že jste tady se mnou a nejenom se mnou, ale i s tím, kdo samozřejmě tohle hnutí celé založil, vymyslel, udělal a hlavně obětuje 100 dní, kde jako osamělý jezdec pojede přes 27 států evropských světových v podstatě a pojede tam jako sám na motorce ve svém vysokém věku, proto aby roznášel svůj zprávu o tom, že je potřeba zachránit naši půdu, to, co nás živí a to, co potřebujeme. Mám radost, že jste tady a doufám, dostala jsem za úkol vás dneska pomoci přesvědčit, abyste pomohli šířit 100 dní tuhletu nádhernou myšlenku. Je to myšlenka, která zachrání nejenom nás, ale hlavně naše děti. Takže pojďte 
těch 100 dnů opravdu do toho vložit a šířit tu dnešní message, kterou samozřejmě Sankuru předá osobně. Já se na něj velice těším, protože on za chviličku přijede na té motorce, na které jede už šestý den. Ano, dnes jsme tady šestý den a má před sebou ještě dost tisíc kilometrů z těch 30 tisíc kilometrů. A co je asi nejdůležitější je, že dnešní den je volání, volání ke schromáždění, protože demokracie, jak říká sám Guru a říkal to dnes i na ambasádě, je silná jenom v případě, pokud má velký počet lidí, kteří šíří nějakou myšlenku a snaží se, aby se prosadila a bez vás se to nepodaří. Protože samozřejmě peníze vždy hrají větší moc než, než zájmy lidí. Takže vaš, váš hlas je to důležité. Tak doufám, že vás dneska nejenom já, ale i dnešní hosté přesvědčí k tomu, abyste pomohli tomuhle tomu nádhernému a opravdu ze srdce vymyšlenému hnutí. Tak co bych ještě řekla k tomu, asi je, že základní myšlenka je, že vaše tělo je i moje tělo. A to naše všech tělo je tělo celého světa, protože my se také jednou změníme v tu půdu, která pak bude živit další a další těla. Je to opravdu na generace. No jsme v 21. století, tak doufejme, že se to pohne k lepší. Když se dneska pustíme video, které uvidíte, jak celosvětové hnutí to je, kdo všechno už tuhle tu akci podpořil. Jsou to nejenom světové politické špičky, ale jsou to také umělecké špičky, protože i umělci pomáhají šířit tuhle tu úžasnou zprávu o tom, že se dějí velké změny ve světě. Step in. Jdeme na to! Já viděla video z Německa, tak doufám, že se tady taky takhle, takováhle energie utvoří, kterou vytvořili v Německu, protože v Německu to opravdu podpořili a všichni byli in, stejně jako naši hosté. Já bych tady dneska chtěla samozřejmě přivítat v první řadě hosty vědce, jako třeba Honza Rak je tady s námi. Ahoj Honzo, ahoj, krásný dobrý odpoledne. Dnešní také budoucí speaker Karla Janeček a toho zase pozvoj za chviličku na pódium. Ahoj, Karle. Tak já myslím, že čas asi na to video už právě teď, protože já už těch slov řekla mnoho a ještě toho bude mnoho a mnohem důležitějšího řečeno, tak si pojďme pustit první video. We are talking about climate change, carbon emissions, and global warming, and various other aspects. But we are not addressing soil. Soil is the habitat upon which zillions of lives thrive. Once there is no richness in soil, then you have forsaken the planet in many ways. Every responsible scientist in the world and the UN agencies are clearly saying we have only 80 to 100 harvests left. That means approximately 45 to 50 years of agricultural soil left on the planet. By 2045, we will be producing 40% less food than what we are producing right now, and our populations will be 9.3 billion people. The food shortages that could manifest in the next 25 years The consequences of that is unimaginable. Civil wars will unfold across the world once there is food shortage. What we are facing now is soil extinction. Why is soil becoming extinct? Where is it going away? What is happening to our soil? We must understand if you add organic content to sand, sand will turn into soil. If you remove all organic content from the soil, soil will become sand. In normal agricultural soil, the minimum organic content should be between 3 to 6 percent. The most minimum is 3 percent. At least this minimum to keep the soil alive, to keep the soil as living soil, is a must. Agricultural soils across the world, the depletion is so heavy. In most countries, 
more than 50% of the topsoil is already gone in the last 100 years. The nutrient levels have dropped significantly. The level of micronutrients you would get from your food in early 20th century to what you are getting from the same food now has dropped 90%. If you ate one orange in 1920s, what you got from it. Now, in 2020, if you have to get the same, you will have to eat eight oranges. This is what we have done to our food. Soil is the biggest ecosystem on the planet, and so few people know anything about it. One teaspoon of healthy soil probably contains more microbes than there are people on Earth. The microbial life in the first 12 to 15 inches of topsoil is the basis of our existence. It is this magic beneath our feet which has produced the life that we are. This first 12 to 15 inches of soil is the basis of life for 87% of life on this planet, including you and me. We have to begin to recognize that what we call our soil on the world is a living organism. Open soils, ripped open by plowing, open to sunlight, is the basis of destruction of microbial life. So the focus should be on agriculture, the focus should be on seeing that land is under shade as much as possible. Some kind of shade, grasses, herbs, bushes, trees. Conscious Planet is launching Save Soil Movement to bring about a policy change to regenerate soil. As a part of this, <laughs> I'm 65 and I'm riding 30,000 kilometers a lone motorcycle journey. 30,000 kilometers across 24 nations to activate support from the citizenry to assure the governments long-term investments will be appreciated. So it's extremely important that soil regeneration is enshrined in the policy of every government on the planet. We must change the narrative on the planet that soil is a wealth, a legacy we have received from previous generations and we have to pass it on as living soil for future generations. We are in a cusp of time, if you do the right things now, in the next 15 to 25 years, we can significantly turn this situation around and regenerate the soil. But if we allow this to progress like this for another 30 to 40 years, after 40 years if we attempt this, then it could take 150 to 200 years because that much loss of biodiversity would have happened. From 21st of March for 100 days, the whole world, every human being on the planet should talk soil. We must hear the word soil, save soil everywhere to see that the narrative on the planet changes towards the most vital aspect of our life, the soil. Each one of you should reach as many people as you can to make this happen. Many global leaders and influencers are already participating in the moment. Be a part of this and let us make it happen. For my part, uh, as much as I can contribute. And the moment that you are taken up, I could not expect any more God's blessing than that. We are going to save the soil. Do your part. And saving the soil. Our future, our children's future. Our planet's future depend on it. <laughs> save soil, my friend. We need to save our soils. And the environment is part of the Save Soil mission. Save the soil. We know what we must do. So let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make, let's make this happen. Let us make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Otázka zní, jsme se Sadgurem? On je tu pro nás, tak buďme tady pro něj i my. 100 dní ve věku 65 let, pojede 30 tisíc 
kilometrů. Začínal 21. března v Londýně a dále pokračoval do Holandska, Německa a dnes večer bude tady v Praze, kam opravdu přijel na té motorce a přímo sem na té motorce přijede. Slovo, které Sadkuru rád zúraznuje, je slovo generace. A silná generace vzniká tak, že se navzájem lidé inspirují a šíří navzájem své myšlenky. Tak prosím, šiřte, já to budu pořád dneska připomínat. Vyhoďte si pak ten plakát a prosím vás, zazdílejte to a tak dále, protože je to důležité, aby to věděli i naše ministři skrz naše sociální sítě, že stojíme za tímto nádherným hnutím. No a teď mým úkolem je naučit vás kus hymny. Kus hymny, která byla vytvořena přímo pro tohle hnutí, a ta hymna se jmenuje Body Soil. A jako jsem to dneska řekla, my body, moje tělo, your body, tvoje tělo, everybody is soil body. Jo, tak to zkusíme, já řeknu my, a vy řeknete body, jo, zkusíme my, výborně, your, everybody is soil. Tak to bude, takže na konci bude hymna, až to tam uslyšíte, tak se tam přidejte, natáčí vás tady kamera, tak ať je vidět, že jsme na tom líp než v Londýně a tak. Zkusíme to potom. <laughs> Každopádně, já už myslím, že jsem všechno, co potřebné, řekla a zajímalo by mě, co řeknete na cestu, kterou dokázal Sadguru s tímto hnutím už po ostrovech, um, karibských ostrovech. Tam navštívil mnoho, mnoho politiků a dokonce podepsal mnoho dohod. Tak asi se na to cestu podíváme na video, abyste viděli, co už opravdu za několik let Sadguru dokázal s tímto hnutím. Další video. It's a great pleasure for me, these beautiful nations, these uh, pearls uh, of uh, the ocean, which are the Caribbean nations are going for this fast. Soil is not a separate subject. If we are interested in health, if we are interested in agriculture, if we are interested in the well-being of the citizens of today and the unborn child of tomorrow, Adding into soil right now, adding into the soil biodiversity right now, this is a must-do thing in our life. Soil. The only thing that we hated about you when you were not on this side, and that only set up by all the hours, we could help love you. and start implementing this. In the next 12 to 15 years, we can make a significant camera. So this memorandum of understanding that we uh, signed, it will also bring some technical assistance to the Caribbean region. This is a historic moment because here is the first step to turn around. Sadhguru, welcome to the Daily Show. Wonderful. I know that we also are facing a soil crisis, where some people are estimating that if we do nothing in 50 years' time, we may not be able to grow anything because we may run out of soil. Which, forgive my ignorance, I did not know that soil is even something that we could run out of. Uh, the thing is. Uh this has happened in the last 50 to 100 years of industrialized farming, that the organic content in the soil is going away because there's no replenishment. Are you getting any signs that governments are, are enthusiastic to try and do something about this? See, in the last two years, I've been talking to various uh, country heads, various politicians, political parties. We have written to 730 political parties on the planet to make sure that they include soil and ecology as a part of their election manifestos as their political philosophy. Whatever they believe in, right, left, center, whatever they are, soil is one thing which is a common factor for all of us. We're always looking at what divides us. 
it's time if you don't understand the consciousness of this cosmos and stuff like that at least you understand you come from the soil you live off the soil when you die you go back to the soil that much you get it so this is something that you are very concerned about and rightly so that there's uh, a problem with the topsoil in america uh, 50 percent of the american farmers have not seen a dollar in the last 12 years and the highest suicide rate among all professions is among the farming community in the United States. I don't want to be that one who didn't care enough to do something which matters because right now we are consuming the soil and food that belongs to an unborn child. This is a crime against humanity. I hear you. Let's make it happen. Let's make it happen. Spiritualist techniques have gained him a following of millions. I mean, we welcome so you in, my life, in the first 15 to 18 inches of the soil, you are a consequence of that. Yeah. Even now, over 60% of your body is actually microbial life, only 40% is of parental genetics. So, ignoring that, thinking you can destroy the soil and live happily upon this planet isn't just a pipe dream, it's not going to work. And you were interviewed by Trevor Noah, who is the darling of the left. And uh, then you were interviewed by Joe Rogan, uh, who is the beloved of the right, basically. So is it Sadhguru who unites the left and the right, or the very important issue? Soil. Soil unites left, right, center, everybody. <laughs> Sadhguruji has said it's important for all, particularly leaders, whose decisions affect millions of lives, to be conscious and inclusive. And this is where each one of us can help. How are we going to make farming more respectable and more, uh, more profitable as well? When I go to the farmer, we are only talking economics. How to enhance your income. And if you want next generation to go for agriculture, this is the only solution that he must make more money than a lawyer or a doctor or a IT professional. I wish you a very uh, successful, joyful, uh, exhilarating uh, journey. I will take care of the acceleration and enjoy myself. Yeah. What I need is, next 100 days from 21st of March, we want the whole world to talk about soil. <laughs> Involve women as leaders in climate action. When uh, this motorcycle journey is being flagged on, we are uh, making a seven or eight year old little girl flag it off. Unfortunately, adults have come to this place where if I see him, I will see what country he belongs to, what race is he, what religion is he, what caste is he, what creed is he, all this nonsense. But when they see a child, a girl child, I believe people's hearts will become a little more tender. If you want to say, I love you to your child, you must just say, safe soil. Because it is a more committed way of saying, I love you. Sadhguru's gift of making a systemic issue so personal to each and one of us in this room, and generational responsibility so relevant for everyone. You know, it's shocking and another thing we need to say this up. And save the soil and act more sensibly and responsibly. It's an extraordinary campaign. It echoes what we in the Commonwealth have been aspiring to do for a number of years. Edge, Edge, give me the toss. Uh, having a bowl. <laughs> I want to go to the Avenue. <laughs> <laughs> Sadhguru 
room. It's a great pleasure to welcome you to London. You are probably one of the most famous Indians, and what you're doing today is really important because people like you who have a wonderful following of millions and millions of people, and what you're doing with that is so important for saving the soil. If only they could have seen this at COP26. So I think what you're doing is phenomenally important. <laughs> In the last 20 years, over 300,000 farmers have committed suicide. If this doesn't wake you up, what else am I asking? What else needs to happen? You think of what that one man did, Nelson Mandela, and he changed his life. So, Sadhguru, you have the ability to change the world for the better. And I was at COP26. I spoke at about 30 different events. Not one person mentioned soil. No one. This many people, 6,000 people, with today's technology available, various platforms available. If you make up your mind, you yourself can reach 3 to 4 million people. Yes or no? So now, when you say such a big yes, now the question is only will you do it or not? Will you make it happen? In case, in case I don't make it, you must make it happen. The young people here should stand up and make it happen. Vidě odehrál. Vidě odehrál. Sadhguru vtančil do našeho sálu. Good evening, Mr. Sadhguru. Good evening. Jsem na vás pišná za krásné přivítání, ale abych na vás mohla být ještě více pišná, tak mám tady takovou důležitou zprávu. Máte s sebou mobilní telefony. Prosím vás, stáhněte si aplikaci, která se jmenuje Live Voice. Live Voice. Když můžete vytáhnout mobily, já to nesluší na žádné akci, ale právě teď si můžete vytáhnout mobily. Pokud máte tu někdo mobil, Výborně, tak aplikace se jmenuje Live Voice a tam se dáte kód, ten kód vám hned řeknu. Máte už staženou aplikaci? Zkuste jo, zkuste. Já to když tak zopakuji později ještě. Now we're talking about the ad, mister. Sadhguru, so it's a very important, yeah. Everybody download the ad, please. Live Voice. Máte? Máme staženo? Dobrý. A ten kód je 6.4. 
8, 8, 9. Tak, tak, tak. A my tady pošleme pak takové papíry, tak to na tom uvidíte. Jo, okay? A ten kód je 6, 4, 5, 8, 8, 9. Tak. Doufám, že máte tuhle důležitou zprávu. Já to ještě z průběhu večera radši zopakuji, protože to je asi poprvé, co máte dovoleno vytáhnout mobily na akci, že jo? Já vím. Každopádně teď už přichází ten správný moment, abych přivítala sem na pódiu dva vzácné hosty. Jedním z nich je již zmiňovaný Karel Janeček. Karel Janeček, ahoj, krásný dobrý večer. Karel Janeček je český matematik, sociální reformátor, pedagog a autor inovativního volebního systému D21. Je také zakladatelem Fondu proti korupci, institutu H21, má spoustu dalších, jako nadační fond Neuron. Karle, ty děláš jednu nadaci za druhou, je to tak? Já jsem to nějak dosáhla z pánného počtu a z pánného tam dále, nebo nepánuji a aktuálně slyšela počty na dací. No je pravda, že jedna z nich je pro tebe nejdůležitější a to zmiňuje, že je to Science 21, je to tak? Je to tak, ale v současné době je to nadace, která propoje schopnosti našeho myšlení a na, na, našeho, vlastně, našeho pohybu, našich aktivit, abychom se lidé jako lidé dokázali hýbat. A propojování vlastně všeho je to nadace, která zdůvěřuje věce, je to nadace, která zdůvěřuje špičkové umělce, sportovce a, a další. A já věřím tomu, že to propojování na příč obory je to důležité v té dnešní době, abychom začali používat naši mysl, naši Děkuji, Karle, posaď se, protože teď přichází, abych představila toho, koho ani představovat nemusím. I think I don't have to introduce this amazing man. A to je náš učitel, is our teacher, our guru. Sadguru! Good evening! Now it's just yours. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so happy to welcome Sadhguru here in Prague on his beautiful voyage, on his beautiful uh, journey on his motorcycle. Cycle, which is so admirable, it means that my greatest admiration to you for your for your energy, for your projects, for your ideas, and for the activities. <laughs> This is absolutely amazing, and uh, I, I believe that we are now on the crossroads of uh, human history. Now is the time where we are deciding about the future, what will happen about our lives, if we live, how we live. And uh, saving the soul is, is, is the crucial element to that, because saving the soul, for me, is saving our lives, uh, and it is saving, saving our planet. And, uh, Now we have the chance, we have the chance finally, because we have uh, the means, we have the technology, and we have something absolutely unique that other human species, other species on the earth do not, do not have. And that is it. It is our rational thinking, I believe, our ability to do that, uh, to do things which in our history, in our human evolution, we haven't used very well, actually. In many times, our thinking, our ability to do rational thinking has been a tool for greed, for uh, getting power, for destroying, for uh, consuming, just consuming, and not using it for it this year, uh, to use it uh, for creation, for making our world better, for connecting our uh, mind and our emotions. 
questions and also for collecting uh, collective consciousness and having, being able to, to find respect and uh, as people to appreciate the differences of each other. Because our mind is one of the things that can make us different, which is, which is great, because we can make a beautiful evolution of our planet Earth. And now is the decisive time for us to make it happen. And it is great that there are people like Sadhguru, which uh, do all the things to help our planet so, uh, to, for us as humans to make it, because otherwise we wouldn't be able to. Thank you. statistics at you, that you consult your Google grandma on <laughs> Maybe I can say that too. <laughs> so, uh, what is it? What is human problem? Human problem is this. to a chimpanzee, you are only, in terms of DNA, you're only 1.23% away from a chimpanzee. 1.23%, not much of a percentage, this is not much of a percentage. This is how close we are physiologically to a chimpanzee. But in terms of our intelligence, our cerebral capability, our ability to be conscious, we are worlds apart from a chimpanzee. So this tremendous gift that we have, that we have the most complex cerebral system on this planet, this has become a problem for most human beings. There are a variety of sufferings. I don't know to what extent you are exposed to human suffering apart from your own. Every day I'm meeting thousands of people. You won't believe how many varieties of suffering people have invented. It's unbelievable. Physical pain, if it comes, that's different. Either because of injury or disease, physical pain comes. That can be dealt with in some way. 90%, I'm just being nice to you. Actually, it's 98%. 90% of human suffering is mental. You agree with me? When was the last time that somebody even poked you with a pen? Hello? Nobody stabbed you. Nobody shot at you. Not even a pin, isn't it? So physical suffering is not been much. It's just here. Everything. If you are poor, you suffer your poverty. If you become rich, you suffer your taxes. If you are not educated, you suffer that. You get into the school, oh my God, that's another suffering. You are not married, you suffer that. You get married... I didn't say anything. I did not say anything. I just got married recently. <laughs> so this goes on with everything. You have no job, you suffer that. Get a job, you kill yourself with your job. 
So it looks like you're suffering every aspect of life. Let's offer you death. Oh my God, you suffer that. So there's a whole lot of people coming up with philosophies. Life is suffering. Life is neither joy nor suffering. Life is just what you make it. Because human experience happens from within you. Pain and pleasure happens within you. Joy and misery happens within you. Agony and ecstasy happens within you. Everything that you ever experienced happens within you, isn't it? Hello? Even right now you're looking at me, you think I'm here. No, you only know me the way I'm reflected in the firmament of your mind. You know the whole story. Light reflects, goes through your lenses, inverted image in the retina. You see me within you. You hear me within you. You have seen the whole world only within you. You don't know any other world than the way it is projected within you. Yes or no? So, when entire human experience is happening within you, at least what's happening within you must happen your way, isn't it? Outside will never happen your way 100%. Even if you're just two people at home, 100% no. 51% if it's happening your way, you have the controlling stick. It's very good. If you try 100%, nobody will be around you. Yes or no? In your home, in your office, or anywhere in the society, if you try, that situation should be 100% your way, there will be nobody around you, they'll all vanish. Only outside situation is like this, a little bit my way, a little bit your way, a little bit somebody else's way. This is the way it is, external situation. But what's happening within me must happen my way, isn't it? If what's happening within you happened 100% your way, would you keep yourself blissful or miserable? You must choose, I'm going to bless you. Blissful, isn't it? Why such a simple thing is not happening? Simply because uh, you have a body, you have a physiology which is just 1.23% away from the chimpanzee. But you have an intelligence which is 1000 points away from a chimpanzee. Now you don't have a stable enough body to handle this. You don't have a stable enough platform to manage this intelligence. Whatever you do, it pokes you. The people come to me and say, Sir, Guru, I can't bear it. My job, my boss is so horrible, he's not even human. And my mother-in-law, oh my God, she's a terror. And my husband, oh, after all her son, you know, all kinds of problems. I tell them, you come, don't worry, you come and stay in the yoga center. We'll give you a nice place to stay. We'll give you good food. You don't have to do anything. Just that I will make random checks on you. When I check, you must be joyful. If you're miserable, I don't believe in feeding misery. So 24 hours you leave them alone in their room. Oh, in how many ways they'll twist themselves. When you're alone, if you're miserable, you're obviously in bad company, isn't it? Hello? I see you're with me and if you're miserable, you can always blame me. It's because of Sadhguru, I'm miserable. You're alone and you're miserable. What? So this is the problem. That an intelligence which needs a conscious approach is still functioning instinctively and unconsciously in reaction to everything, like a chimpanzee. Chimpanzee is okay, because his intelligence is only that much. He can do what he wants. He won't cause much damage. But once you have risen to this level of intelligence and competence, you are supposed to function consciously. Otherwise, you will be a disaster. This is the disaster that is unfolding on the planet. Whatever has happened here, in terms of ecological damage, environmental damages, is not because of some evil design. Somebody, one evil man is causing ecological disaster. There is no such thing, though we always like to find such a man. The simple thing is, everybody is in pursuit of happiness, pursuit of well-being, are you? Everybody in pursuit of happiness. 
Now, uh, there was a potato farmer. You heard of him? No. There was a potato farmer. One day he wanted to eat apples. So he went to the apple tree. Out of sheer habit, he started digging for the apples. When he didn't find any, any he got very furious and really started digging. Then the tree came down on him. This is the case of humanity on the planet right now. You think when you were a child, you found a lollipop and it made you so happy. You remember the taste? I can get the taste back in my mouth. Lollipop made you so happy. Now you thought there are many lollipops in the entire world and you went on getting it, getting it, getting it. Lollipop has turned bitter in your mouth. Because it's not the lollipop which made you happy, it is the tongue which made you happy. Hello? Yes or no? If you didn't have a tea, you know, sensitive tongue, you put the lollipop with as good as a stick. So, <laughs> So, your experience is happening from within you, but you are trying to get it from outside. This is destroying the world. And we have taken it this far, where it's come to a point, now we are talking about soil extinction. We have talked about dinosaurs going extinct, dodo going extinct, but we have the footprint of a dinosaur in the brain of a dodo. Right now, behaving like dodos. But dinosaurus kind of footprint, this is not a good combination. That is what is happening right now. No evil design. Now, everybody says, okay, who did it? Let's hit the oil companies. Let's hit the coal company. Let us hit the automobile company. No, no, all of us are partners in this. Every one of us. Right now, when we sit here, these lights are on. Something is burning somewhere, isn't it, to keep these lights on? Hello? All of us are partners in this destruction, knowingly or unknowingly we have done it. If all of us partner in reversing the process, it can also be done. I'm just asking, will you? Only three people. I must. I must tell them a story that happened in Praha in 1835. Is there any historical event at that time in case I got it wrong? Nothing, right? 1835 is not a sensitive time. Okay. This happened in 1835. At that time, people in, in the city believed that there are people on the moon. Because it keeps changing shades and this... So people are moving and you know you can see it. So they wanted to talk to them. Well, they all decided how. All the wise men in the town decided we'll do one thing. At a given moment, let's keep the lights on, let the people be. They may take the So, uh, the wise men in the city decided, let's all get on our rooftops at a given moment, and all of us in one voice will ask, who? Let's see what they say. That moment was approaching, all of us got on top of the rooftops. Then, I thought, you know, without a microphone, I want it to be heard. What is that? I'm a small man. This guy is there, such a big voice. That guy is there, or she is there. Such big voices. What is me? I'm nothing. This is a special moment where everybody is going to utter one word at a given moment. So I thought, let me see. Anyway, I'm a small fellow. What's the news? So I just kept quiet. That moment came and it passed in utter silence. That's what happened just now when I asked, will you do it? Yes. And uh, indeed, uh, we have uh, gone through much uh, bad things, suffering uh, because of our minds and because of the uh, 
because of our abilities and also local success as human society. And now uh, the question is why is that? Why has it been happening? Perhaps it is, uh, perhaps it is uh, good for our evolution. It might be good for us to learn all, all the, the whole, the entire scope of, my, of our mind, what we can get to, what the negative things, in order to be able to, to reach uh, the, the, ups, the upper potential of uh, what, we can, what we can create. So at this moment, I'm going to abuse you, okay? Very bad abuse I'll do. But I'll do in a language that you don't understand. I'll use one of the Indian languages. But I'll abuse it with a smile on my face. Do you have any problem? Absolutely no. No. Because you don't understand. So you respond differently. So I want you to know that abuse doesn't hurt you. It is the way you react which hurts you. But if I do it in English or in Czech, then you will react. It's your reaction which hurts you. Not the abuse. Abuse is not a bullet. Hello? So like this, the problem is people are in a state of reaction, compulsive reaction, rather than being in a conscious response. Once you're a compulsive reaction, whatever you react to, you become enslaved to that. So in this enslavement, they suffer reacting, series of reactions. Because your uh, art, music, television shows, cinema, everybody is showing. More emotionally dramatic you are, the more of a star you are. If you are uh, really something, you must pick up these things and throw. Suddenly your emotions like this at your home, that you take plates and vessels and throw it into the wall. You're still doing that? But almost every movie is how they handle. Otherwise, a hero means you must go and punch somebody in the face. Hello? Otherwise he's not a hero. If he does this, he's not a hero. He has to punch somebody in the face. So we've created these images, these role models, that if you are of some worth, you must be doing something violent. Either emotionally or physically, you must do something violent. So people are doing this, not to the extent it's shown in the movie, but uh, they're doing it and suffering it. First of all, the first violence is towards yourself. See, if I ask you a simple question, do you want your mind to be sharp or blunt, you must choose, I'm going to bless you. Those who did not choose. So, uh, it is sharp means, can go, no problem. There's no traffic, you can go. So, uh, if Essentially, your mind is a sharp instrument. That means it is a cutting instrument. If you want to dissect something, it's a very good thing. But how many things can you know by dissection? See, I really want to know you. Shall I dissect you? Like how you did in your high school, you wanted to know the frog, so you open it up when it's alive. I'm saying if I dissect you, I may find your heart, liver, kidney, something else. But will I know you this way? If I embrace you, if I include you, I may know something about you. If I cut you off, will I know you? Material aspects of life you can dissect and know. So whether you use a scalpel or the scalpel of your mind, you are only doing dissection. All you will do is leave the world tattered. Right now, like how the modern fashions are, it looks like they are stitching with a knife. You know, all that. And uh, when we, when we uh, use our reaction, intuitive, uh, spontaneous emotional reactions, it can cause, as you mentioned, it, it can be a cause of a lot of trouble, but it, that, it can also be very positive. I believe we should not limit ourselves to just uh, react uh, thoughtfully. I mean, we should react thoughtfully. No, no, I'm not saying you must be soft or harsh. You must respond consciously. If you respond consciously, only if you respond consciously, 
you can employ your intelligence. If you respond or react instinctively, going back to your animal nature, that's all. That means essentially you are disregarding evolutionary process. <laughs> and would it be uh, possible to evolve our, our intuition, our instinctive reaction to be unconscious as well? See, intuition, let's fix this word. The word intuition, people are thinking usually that they have some other access. No. It is just like, uh, I heard that you are a mathematician. So we are far away, okay? <laughs> but uh, there is no way you can explore mysticism without mathematics. Not mathematics as you know, adding numbers on this, but mathematics as creation is. The mathematics is a relevant subject only because in some way it imitates or it is sort of a blueprint of physical creation. So, uh, both mysticism and music have enormous mathematics in it. Maybe people will just know only the melody. They do not know the math of it. But there is a whole mathematics to fix mysticism and also like that. So, suppose to go through a certain mathematical process. Let's say there are ten steps. You go through the ten steps. But there may be somebody who will not go through the 10 steps, they just jump to the 10th step. That's intuition. It is just a different level of computing, not a different level of perception. It is hugely misunderstood. Because they compute differently, it looks magical. This happened to me. Well, uh, when I was, when I was probably 13 at that time, 13 or 14 maybe. Thirteen, because I know the class in which I was. For the first time, somebody brought a calculator. Those days in India, only Sony and Panasonic calculators came. These big, you know, tabletop kind of thing. Then uh, somebody brings this. We have never seen this before. And say, look at this, uh, eighteen hundred and you know, thirty-six into 18,000, 300, and whatever, whatever, boom, you press it to the answer came. I felt really insulted. If this is, if this is how it is, why the hell are they grinding me in the mathematics class every day? <laughs> Everybody is asking, how much is 12 into 12? This damn thing can do it in a moment. Why am I going through all these works. So at that time I dreamt, suppose like this, for every stupid question they are asking me in the school, is there was a machine. How simple it would be. At last in this generation that machine is coming true. I dreamt of it when I was 13. But too late, you know, for me. <laughs> well, um, it might be one of the future parts that we might have um, Internet in our world, direct access, and uh, things like that. And it is it is, I believe it is already becoming technically feasible to be able to connect in that sense. To, but what, what I consider extremely important that all the technologies, all these abilities are our tools. And it never must be uh, the slaves of the tools. No, we will become the tool, that's the problem. That we must not have. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> must not is a good intention. But how do you get there? See, we need to understand, we need to differentiate between these two. There is information and there is consciousness. These are two different things. Information means essence in memory. See, right now, you have a, a human body. Suppose, you know, I don't want to take you as an example, let's take somebody, okay? <laughs> I need a volunteer, a male volunteer. I can't talk to a woman like that. So, uh, you are in a human form. Next three months you eat dog food. Will you th do you think 
furious will stand up and you will grow a tail or something like this. Nothing like that will happen because there is such a well-established evolutionary memory here which clearly says this is a human being. Eat whatever the hell you want. It will only take human form because there is a memory, there is a program out here. And now, I'll take you to India, this example you must come, okay? I'll take you to India and I'll give you, I'm a very good cook. If you come and eat with me, you may not leave India. Six months you stay there. Six months you stay there, you eat the South Indian food. Do you think your skin will become like mine? I'm so outside. <laughs> I'm saying there is a memory within you. Every cell in your body carries memory, which is millions of years. How your forefathers looked? Still there. You may not remember how your great 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 grandfather looked, but his nose may be sitting on your face. So, so what you call as myself right now is a complex amalgamation of memory. In yoga, we identify eight different types of memory. Let me not go into those details. So, there is evolutionary, genetic, karmic, conscious, unconscious, articulate, inarticulate memories like this. So, these memories are determining how you will look, how you are, how you behave, everything. But what we are referring to as consciousness is there is a, another dimension of intelligence within you which is unsullied by memory, which is not touched by memory. That intelligence, when it functions, see, memory is a great possibility. Today, you, as a man, you are a man, you are a human being, and you are so many things in your life only because of your memory, isn't it? Right now. No, no, no. Okay. All right. <laughs> right now, the person that you are is only because of your memory, isn't it? If I remove your memory, would you know your name? Oh, so no. Yes. So, all this memory is making this body work in this way. You are this kind of a person. You remember this. You remember that. So, this memory is making you a tremendous possibility in many ways. Now, your intelligence is about how do you use this memory? All right. Some people may carry this memory as a burden. Some people may use it very well. That's a different aspect. But memory is also a boundary. That is you, this is me. How? That is your memory, this is my memory. Isn't it? Though memory is a great possibility, memory is also a boundary. So there is an intelligence which is unsullied by memory. If you touch that dimension of intelligence, your experience of life will become boundless without boundaries because memory is the one which causes boundary to you. Your boundary is only because of your memory. If there is no memory, there is no boundary. See, this is my friend. Why? She's in my memory. This is a stranger. Why? That person is not in my memory, isn't it? So, there is a way this is possible only for a human being that a human being can rise above the impressions of life that has happened within us. All these impressions are making us into a complex person and possibility. At the same time, it's limiting us. So you can rise above this memory. The moment you rise above your memory, above your memory in your experience, there is no nationality for you. There is no gender for you. There is no religion for you. There is no philosophy for you. You're beyond all these things. So, when your intelligence rises beyond the package of memory that is you right now, then there is a tremendous possibility for a human being. This is called yoga. And uh, perhaps we could add mathematics. Or ability to, to experiment or um, 
consistency in the sense uh, maybe I, I would consider this I could, would consider mathematical science like uh, the, the skeleton of our uh, existence of the universe because it's something that's given and uh, unlike all the other things or uh, I think that all things are changing. We know that we do not know all like physical laws and uh, all these things that the science is saying are actually not cut in stone. We, those are approximations. Those are something that we uh, evaluate as best as we can, except perhaps mathematics. Highly prejudiced man. See, uh, the mathematics as you know today, I do not disagree with what you said. It's, it's correct on one level, which is true. But at the same time, the physical existence, which has a form and a size and a boundary, every physical object has, is defined by its boundary. Why that is you, this is me. That's the boundary, this is the boundary, isn't it? So, all, everything that's physical is always defined by its boundary. So, all that is bound by boundaries, that you can define or describe through mathematical numbers. That which doesn't have a boundary, you have no math for that. Well, you can use the zero, you can use the infinite symbols, but it doesn't say anything. Because that which doesn't have a boundary, you cannot bring it under the scope of mathematics. That is what mysticism means. There, there may be a level of uh, mathematics which is uh, completely abstract, which perhaps doesn't uh, need to really, but there is a like Cartesian system where it doesn't need to, uh, I mean, Cartesian system is uh, the boundaries, but there could be different series, but I think uh, this is... <laughs> they, uh, once you leave the framework of logic of numbers, number is the most basic logic in human mind and in the creation. Once you leave the logic of numbers, it is no more mathematics. Because modern scientists are unwilling to admit that their logic is useless beyond a certain point. They are creating what is called as fuzzy logic. If it's fuzzy, it's not logic. See, for example, if you look up in the sky, because of the way our visual apparatus are made, if you look up in the sky, even a little child, if you make them look up in the sky, even if you don't tell them anything, they see the stars in the night. And, uh, you know, because uh, as a rule, because I refuse to learn anything right from my childhood, as a rule, I told everybody not to teach a damn thing to my girl when she's growing up. Nobody should teach her anything. Just leave her alone. No ABC, no one, two, three, no nothing. Just leave her alone. If you want to play with her, be with her. No teaching. No Mary had a little lamb. Because I don't care whether she had a lamb or not. <laughs> so, even this little girl, which you don't teach her anything, I, I always expose her to nature, spend time in the jungle, and, you know, if possible, if nothing else is possible, at least the rooftop in the night to see the stars. See, look at this okay. Ten. Even she knows ten is the biggest number. She is this is hardly one year. She looks at the stars. I am not somebody who will tell her, no, no, this is a billion. What does it matter? Ten is good enough. Ten is the biggest number it is finding. Hasn't this happened to you, to your monetary system? Just some time ago, you know, 50 years ago or even 25 years ago, you were a millionaire means you were a wow. Now a millionaire means... <laughs> yes or no? 
Then he said, up. So, I'm saying what? Up? 20 baht is my job. 20 baht is your number, how come? There are some mathematical other reasons for that, but I don't know. In the yogic system, 21 is very important. A lot of people who are practicing Sambhavi, they all know what is 21. Anyway, it's a yogi called Aryabhata from India who invented the zero. Not by doing mathematics, by simplicity and madness, becoming absolutely empty. That could only be defined with the zero. Talking about uh, the numbers, uh, I heard from you uh, this amazing number, 27,000, which is, uh, this is just uh, enormous. Uh, this is the number of species that uh, are going, going extinct per year. Yeah, per year. Um, and um, maybe uh, my question would be, uh, how do we define species exactly? So you are the mathematician, tell me. <laughs> In another 30, 40 years, how many? But what so what is the total number of species? Yeah. How's, uh, we do not know. We know only one percent of the microbial life. The science today knows approximately one percent. That is also a guess. It may be even below that. It is trillions of them. Okay? How many species nobody knows? We identified a million or a million point two or something like this, but that is just one percent. It is too complex a life system. Soil is the most complex life living system in the entire universe, not just on this planet. There is no other place in the known universe for us where there is that kind of a rich living system, and that we are ripping apart without any awareness about. I consider perhaps symbolically, um, like a symbolic message that uh, one of the most fertile, perhaps the most fertile soil on the earth is now in a country which is now in war, in Ukraine. Yeah, so, um, what perhaps, uh, what can we say about that? Or um, is it, um, I, I, based on my information, like the uh, extremely fertile soil in Ukraine is up to four meters, uh, the black soil, the, the most fertile soil on the, on the earth. So how do we, what do we do? Uh, see, the thing is this, when nations across the world, almost without exception, fortunately, Europe was not going that way after World War II, but now once again they're going that way. Almost every nation has invested enormous amount of money in building and stockpiling uh, arms, armaments, bombs, missiles, smart bombs. I don't know how a bomb can be smart. It's the dumbest thing to do. <laughs> it is the dumbest thing to do. See, at least uh, if I pick a fight with you with a sword or a stick or something, there is some crude animalistic pleasure attached to it. A uh, thousand people are sitting here, you just drop a bomb, all of them died. I don't know what is smart about that. I cannot understand this. But they are talking about smart bombs where they are saying from two miles in the sky, they can drop the bomb into your house through the window. They're very proud of this. So this is not one nation, across the world, all right? So all of us as people, were we all thinking, all these bombs are being kept for entertainment, for display, or it's artwork, what did you think? One day it will be used. Yes or no? It has to be used somewhere. The question is on whom? The question is not whether it will be used or not. The question is just where and on whom, isn't it? 
So when it is piling up, we are all okay with it. In every movie, there is no movie without a bomb or at least a smashed face. We are all enjoying it. When it really happens, we say, oh, we're shocked, we're shocked. It doesn't work like that, life. This is why I'm telling you about the soil. Will you grieve after the disaster? Or will you be that generation will turn the disaster around? This is all the choice we have. Because this is our time on the planet. How we do our life is our life, isn't it? So, wars are almost inevitable because economies are built on war. Without war, a lot of people cannot survive. The largest industry on the planet is arms and armaments. How will you not use it? If I am making guns and bullets and I sell it to you and you don't shoot a single bullet, I am disappointed with you. <laughs> Hello? This happened, I was at the World Economic Forum. At that time, the Sudanese war was going on, you know, terrible war. Over uh, 2,600,000 people died, out of which 50% were children below six years of age. Can you beat it? 130,000 children die in one war. So, at that time, some, you know, movie stars and others are going there and carrying one, you know. An African child is always a trophy. You carry this child and take photo ops and all this is happening. I said, see, and they showed a video where all these uh, militants or soldiers or whatever you want to call them, they're just going in these pickup trucks, simply shooting at the sky, okay? I said, see, these guys, if I have a fight with you, at least I need to shoot you. If I'm shooting the sky, that means I have abundant supply of, a, of bullets, isn't it? Abundant supply. Otherwise, I won't be shooting the clouds. If I'm fighting a war, when I shoot, I want somebody to die. Yes or no? Hello? I'm not, I'm not going to shoot at the sky but they're shooting at the sky with automatic weapons continuously. I said, see, somebody is supplying them plenty, all right? Otherwise, nobody will shoot at the sky. I said, there are 62 industries in the world who manufacture that caliber of bullet. I will give you the addresses. Will you go and lock them up? No. You will go to the war zone and pick up a child and do drama. All you need to do is, if you take away the bullets, once that runs out, uh, maybe they will hack each other. But you can't kill that many hacking, at least. If you can't transform the human being, at least you must defang him, isn't it? Hello? Yeah. Defang means you take away his teeth at least. If, if transformation is possible, fantastic. If that is not possible, at least his empowerment, you should bring it down, isn't it? So, we have no intent of stopping the war. Let's be clear about that. When it happens to us or when it happens close to us, we will cry. When it's happening somewhere else, it's drama. This inhuman attitude towards war and to killing and the suffering that other people go through, must, uh, we must come out of that. Because most evil things have happened, not necessarily because of evil intentions, simply apathy. You sleep through life. Is sleeping a crime? Hello? Is sleep a crime? Hello? No, sleep is a good thing. But if you sleep through your life, your life is a disaster. That is what is happening to the world, both in terms of soil, both in terms of, and in terms of war. This is what is happening. We sleep through. After World War II, we formed League of Nations, we made United Nations. The idea was never again such wars will happen, right? Not just for Europe, for the whole world, never again it will happen. But <laughs> since then, how many wars? Actually, if you look at it, there's not been a single day's break on this planet after World War II without at least a battle going on somewhere. 
So, we have issues. We have economic issues, we have property issues, we have issues, all right? If we are civilized enough, we must… Say, we, this is the idea of setting up a United Nations that we will fight with our words and solve our problems. We are not saying we are not in such a la la land that we don't have any issues. We have issues. We genuinely have issues, isn't it? That two sets of people believe this is it, that is it, there. But this is the idea of setting up a platform which would solve problems. What has happened? <laughs> we have pushed it to the side and doing what we want to with each other. So, twentieth century, twenty-first century when it began, Everybody, oh, 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 oh. <laughs> Everybody said, this is twenty-first century, this is the age of information, this is technology, this, that, no wars. Tell me how many wars in twenty-first century? How many nations have been destroyed in twenty-first century? Many. Too many. Too many for twenty-two years, isn't it? So how do we wake up? See, these are things that you can't turn around overnight, but first thing is within your hearts, your anger and hatred must go. I must tell you this, I used to attend a lot of uh, world peace conferences at one time. For about two years, two and a half years, I attended a lot of international conferences. Then I saw for a whole lot of people, this conference hopping itself is a profession, they're making a living out of it. I'm the only idiot sitting there thinking we are working for <laughs> world peace. <laughs> so I was in a, a very prominent conference, forty-two Nobel laureates were participating and a few ex-heads of state and all that stuff. Because when they are head of state, they will do war. After they retire, they will talk peace. <laughs> this has been the way of the world. So, uh, I was here and uh, this is the third day afternoon. One particular <laughs> Nobel laureate, it's his turn to, his turn to speak and after that I am speaking. So he came up and uh, there is no… this podium is a little exposed, a proper big podium, you know, the wooden thing. So he went and stood behind that and he opened his file. He looked down, he never lifted up his head up, he read forty-two pages. <laughs> and I was sitting in the front row trying to grasp every word, I'm watching every page, forty-two pages he flipped. Then I look around, the hall is absolutely peaceful. Because everybody, except the security and a few staff who are standing, everybody has fallen asleep. <laughs> then I thought, this is world peace for sure <laughs> Then my turn to speak came and I said, see, uh, in the last three days I've heard so many bombastic speeches about creating world peace. But I'm asking you sincerely, how many of you can place your hand on your heart and say, your mind is peaceful? Because if your mind is not peaceful, if you can't make your mind peaceful, making the damn world peaceful is out of question. Because what you are seeing in the world is a larger manifestation of what's happening in human minds, isn't it? If there are no human beings on this planet, world is peaceful, isn't it? <laughs> so then I inquired, then I inquired why in the afternoon session everybody has fallen asleep uniformly. You know, there was a certain unity about it, except me and a re reader, he's not a speaker, a reader. Everybody has fallen asleep. Then I asked, what happened? He said, no Sadhguru, yesterday evening there was a Bacardi festival. <laughs> oh, free drink. So everybody became peaceful. <laughs> so, that, uh, that was the last World Peace Conference I went to.
So like, let us make the wish to make our minds peaceful globally and I think Olga wants to… No, this is the whole thing. We can't make everybody's mind peaceful. You can make yours peaceful, I can make mine peaceful, she can make hers peaceful. This is the only way it works. This is the problem. We talk about a world, we talk about a society, we talk about a human… humanity. No, all these are just vocabulary. There are only human beings. If this one and this one does not solve their problems, the world's problems are never gone. It will manifest in so many ways. Děkuji pánům za sdílení jejich myšlenek. A teď přichází speciální moment, moment na vaše otázky. A protože tady dneska máme speciálního hosta a tím je profesor Jan Rak, který pracoval dlouho, dlouho s největšími urychlovači, tak já bych první otázku a třeba i nějaký komentář tady předala Honzovi. Hey, pojď na stage, Honzo. Say something that I understand, oh, please. I forgot you don't have the, the app. Uh, this is our Czech, a very famous scientist, oh, Jan Rak, and I asked him to make a little bit comment and ask the first question. Yes. 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 Oh, thank you. <clears throat> It's a great honor to, you know, to speak to you, to see you actually in face. I admire, I think I really enjoyed your speech and I, and I, I, it's hard to say, but I think I entirely agree with you. <laughs> I, uh, we, we have a lot of conversation with Karel since, uh, because he's mathematicians and I think we as a physicist, you know, see the reality slightly different. You know, for me the, <clears throat> the biggest… <laughs> <laughs> he's, get, he's getting the numbers wrong. <laughs> no, no, no. You know, for, for me the… The biggest question is what is actually consciousness, you know, and I think the way how to solve the problem, for me the big inspiration… So if you can come up, sir, please, sir, so oh, people can see you. <laughs> people can see you, that's all I'm saying. I, I think you can see me, right? So, the, <laughs> sorry, the biggest inspiration is always that <clears throat> to solve a problem, you never can solve the problem in the same level. Uh, where the problem comes from. You have to always to step back, kind of, that's why I love also the metaphysics, you know, that you have to step back to leave the level where the problem arose and, and try to solve it from a different level, from the different perspective. And at the end, I believe that uh, the way to solve all our problems come really to bring our own peace, uh, our own mind into a peace. This is, I think, what I really like to emphasize that that's the very great thing. Anyway, um, I don't think I have a question. <laughs> well, uh, maybe, uh, Maybe you can, if I can ask you, yes, what sir. do you think how to bring the Eastern knowledge of what the consciousness is and what is actually the reality we are experiencing, you know, what it is, you know, because we in the Western countries, we all believe that somehow the world is uh, mechanistic, you know, that everything exists as a subjective, uh, sorry, objective law of, uh, you know, physics and so on. But um, I think I learned a lot of from studying, you know, Eastern philosophy, which is saying that somehow the prime, kind of the source of everything is more consciousness and not the objective. Uh, can you maybe elaborate something on that? Thank you a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Prosím vás, pro ty, kdo nerozumíte, tak ta aplikace je, tam je přímo simultární překlad, takže budete rozumět všemu, takže live voice a to číslo, které jsem posílala. I'm just talking about the translation. Okay. I thought you were answering the question. Because I, I always... Did you forget it? No. <laughs> I can translate. So... Uh, no, no, I'm saying uh, when I was in school, my homework was always done by my sisters. So, 
I could. <laughs> It's good. <laughs> Clever man. Now, yeah, I just wanted to tell them about the app again, you know, so they, they understand answers. So, uh, <clears throat> so you use the word Eastern knowledge. When I say East and West, I, I would not like to look at it as geographically East and West. In terms of uh, approach and attitude, there is a East and there is a West in the world. That Eastern person may be in the West, you know, <laughs> it's not necessarily geographically it is. But East and West represents, I, I understand what you mean by East and West, it represents a certain thing. So East does not come from knowledge. East comes from methods to enhance perception. Because accumulated knowledge is always looked down upon in the East. It may be useful, you can do things with it. Things means what? You will just survive better. See whether you earn, what are you? Your currency is euro. What is it? Check? Crown. Check crown. Okay. Oh, you don't have a, you don't have a euro yet? No. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. So let us say, if you, if you earn uh, a million crowns, okay? If you earn a million crowns, you think you are well-to-do in a given society. This accumulation enhances only your comfort and convenience levels. It doesn't enhance your life in any way. So this must be understood, everything that you're calling as life right now is not about life, it is just accessories of life. You have a car, it's a convenience and an accessory, you get somewhere fast. Otherwise if you walk, you may take ten times or hundred times the time that you take. Or you have good clothes, well it protects you, it makes you present yourself in a certain way. Or you have a phone, it gives you certain excess. You have a good home, it, the comfort empowers you to do something better. But it will not enhance you because you can live in a palace and be absolutely miserable. You can sit on a pile of money and be absolutely miserable. Most successful people are carrying long faces, isn't it? Most of them, not all of them fortunately. But a whole lot of successful people are dying of stress. Uh, why? Because, <laughs> you know, somebody comes to me, he's heading a, a multinational company internationally. Mm, he's based elsewhere, but he came to India to see me and he was in an extreme state of distress. He says, Sadhguru, this pressure I cannot take, like this, uh, I'm, I'm just breaking down what to do. I just looked at him and said, I look here. I said, let me bless you, may you be fired. <laughs> he said, Guru, Sadhguru, what are you doing? I said, you're suffering your job so much. <laughs> Get rid of it, learn to walk the beach at least. Somebody else will take it, maybe they will do it a little more joyfully than you. What is the point of this? No, no, my job, because it's a sought after job, even if you die. It's sought after job. Well, today people are making little better decisions about their jobs and stuff, that's different. But you must understand that anything that you accumulate, including your body and your knowledge, can only create convenience and comfort. It will not enhance your life. It will enhance your life socially. If you have ten crowns and somebody has nothing, you are enhanced socially. Essentially, this social enhancement means you're suffering other people's failures. I mean, sorry, you're enjoying other people's failures. See, right from kindergarten, you're doing this to your children maybe, you must be number one. What does this mean? All the other children must be below your child and he must enjoy their failures. It starts from there. So when you enjoy other people's failures, I don't call this joy. I call this sickness, I don't know what you call it. <laughs> so,
So anything that you accumulate, anything that you accumulate never is you. This body you accumulated, but now you're thinking it's you. These impressions you accumulated in your mind, you think it's you. See right now, if I say, this is my vessel, you will think, oh, Sadhguru seems to have some problem. <laughs> but everybody says he's wise, let us listen. After some time I say, this is me, then you will say, let's go. <laughs> okay, this is a clear case. Hello? If I think this is me, it's a clear case, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it's a clear it's case. It's a case. <laughs> case number, we don't know what, maybe twenty-one. <laughs> so this is what you're doing every day. Food appears on your plate, you eat it and then you say, this is me. You read a book, some things, this, 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 sticks in your head and you think, this is me. The moment you think what is not as… not you as yourself, you kind of lost it, isn't it? Hello? Once you made that one mistake, you will not know anything. All you will know is accumulations and accumulations because that is the basis of your experience right now. So this is what East is symbolic about, that we don't identify with our accumulations. In yogi culture, Always, the whole training is to identify with your ignorance. Because your knowledge, how much ever you know, if you have read the libraries of the world, still compared to the cosmic space, your knowledge is a minuscule, isn't it? If you identify with this minuscule, you will become that. See, right now you're a Czech. How are you a Czech? Because you identify with that nation nationality, isn't it? What you identify with, you become that. So if you identify with a minuscule knowledge, you will become that minuscule knowledge. Somebody else who is far more ignorant than you, in front of him you are a smart guy, but otherwise it means nothing. So the yogic culture always identifies with ignorance because our ignorance is boundless. So, what, what you're referring to as consciousness is that boundless ignorance handled joyfully is consciousness. Tak máme tady už nějakou další otázku od někoho z vás. Tak já tady mám s mikrofonem chodící stav. Vidím někde někoho s mikrofonem. With microphone, do we have somebody? So, the man in a red, I can give you mine. So, Sadhguru, uh, my name is Alex, thank you for coming. And so I do the Isha Kriya many mornings, so I see you and <coughs> hear you a lot. And I was surprised that most people that I've talked to do the Isha Kriya, which is quite amazing. Can anyone raise their hand if they do the Isha Kriya? Uh, it's okay. Which is Quite a lot. <laughs> Question time. <laughs> yeah. So, um, in, 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 in my meditation, sometimes I, I kind of arrived to an inner conclusion that we can really get to a point that we are thankful about even pain because we are not even able to make uh, one hair in a laboratory. So, um, am I on the right track if I think that we can also be <laughs> uh, 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 thankful for pain? Uh, this one hair cannot be made in the laboratory is a, a century old thing you're talking. Now they can even make your nose, maybe your liver and kidney in a, a little bit of time, but that is not going to enhance your life. Instead of two kidneys, if you put six, you know, I'm saying we used to do two cylinders, now it's all six, eight, twelve cylinders. So if you add, your life is not going to get enhanced. It is just that uh, you may go to the bathroom more often or may, you may not have to go. <laughs> we don't know what happens. But I'm saying whether you manufacture hair or nose or kidney, liver, heart or even your brain, your life will not be enhanced that way. When I say life, 
you are always thinking life means situation. No, th what's happening here is life. Hello? Situations are there. Life situations are different, life is different. If there is a… I don't want to use you as an example, please sit down, please sit down. See, suppose, have you ever seen a dead body, Alex? Yes. You've seen, you've been to some funeral. See, this guy is lying down like this. You show him a billion crowns. <laughs> show him the biggest diamond in the world. Show him the most beautiful woman in the world. He doesn't care a damn about anything, <laughs> simply because life has been taken out. That's the only damn thing you have, that you're alive. How alive you are is the question. This related to this consciousness question. When you were in school, did you blow uh, soap bubbles? Yes, when I was a kid. Was it big or…? <laughs> I don't remember. <laughs> if it was big, you would have remembered. <laughs> so, right now both of us will blow soap bubbles. Your bubble is like this, my bubble is like that. Now I said, that is my bubble. Big one is my bubble. Poop, it went. Then I don't say this is my air. You don't know which is my air, which is your air here, there's no such thing. But the moment it's captured in the bubble, this is my bubble, that's your bubble, isn't it? This is all that's happened to you and me. It's a living cosmos. You captured some, I captured some. The only way you can enhance life is that you must blow a little bigger bubble. It is not by blowing up your bank balance or your size of your home, or things that you have, all kinds of accumulations including knowledge, you will not feel enhanced as a life. Only socially you will be enhanced. You must look at it this way, every one of you. Suppose you are the only person on this planet. Whatever you have, does it still mean something to you? This is the important thing you have to look at. You are the only person sitting on this planet right now. So, Fine clothes, do they mean something to you? Lot of money, does it mean something to you? Your nose is like this and it's the most beautiful nose, does it mean something to you? I'm asking, no. The only thing that matters to you is you're alive and how alive. When I say how alive, you're not as alive all the time, isn't it? Different times. See this little child, you can't keep them down, they're too alive. All right, <laughs> but slowly, because uh, I'm sorry. If you don't like the answer, I'll stop. You want to dance? We'll come to that. We'll come to that. <laughs> so there is what East is known for is just this: ways to enhance this life. The life that you are itself is enhanced. If you sit here, not doing anything, you are a very enhanced life. Your experience of life is hugely enhanced. Only when that happens, you will learn to even come to ease. Otherwise you can't come to ease. When your idea of enhancement… If my idea of enhancement is being better than this guy, how can I come to ease? Cannot come to ease, isn't it? When you feel enhanced simply sitting here by your own nature, then you can come to ease, otherwise you cannot come to ease. If you do not even know what is to be at ease, how will you know what is to be peaceful? How will you ever know what it means to be blissful? Such things won't happen. Here and there some stimulation may cause some bliss, some ecstasy, some something, but that will not last, it is just a high and then a low, always. So. It is not about being joyful, it's not about peaceful. Even being joyful, please, peaceful, blissful is just an ambience for life. It is just that your own emotions should not become an impediment in your life so that this consciousness can function. 
joy, peace, blissfulness are not the goals of life. It is an ambience that you need if you really want to make use of what human life is to its fullest possibility because this human life, for what possibilities that it holds, the time that's given to you is too little. Too little. It's not… it's just not enough. You know you're all mortal or… are there some immortal people here? <laughs> Hello? All mortal? You're immortal? All the best for you. Because that's the most miserable thing that can ever happen to you is you cannot die. <laughs> if suppose you cannot die at all, oh, you're finished. <laughs> so, this mortality is the basis of our existence. That is, as we sit here, in the last one hour, all of us are one hour closer to our graves. If you do little yoga, you can kick the can, but you can't avoid it. All right? Nobody can avoid it. If we understand it's time-related, now we will get into physicist and the mathematician will get into a clash here because uh, how we see this is, time is the basis of existence. Space is a consequence of time. Now debate is between the two of you to fight, <laughs> not me. So the first… The first chant that I did, the chant that I did is just about that, that only one who has mastery over time, only that one is at absolute ease. Otherwise, time will keep you running all the time. Please, madam. So, next question. Okay. The next man. Hello. Hello, Sadhguru, once again. Um, what do you mean once again? You are, ah, I've met you before. have yes. you come with your children now? Yes, my daughter is here. Uh, have you told them what I've told you? I did, I did. Okay, very that's much. great. Already the news is over here. Um, my question is, are schools across the globe participating in these 95-day movement? And uh, if so, it is going to make profound impact, having schools participate into this movement. That would be my question to you. Why question you? Do it, huh? Is it my planet? It's yours also. <laughs> of course, of course. But if they are already… if… and can schools sign up as well? All those things are being done but getting all the schools on the globe is uh, another matter, all right? So I'm saying first of all, you must… whatever great ideas you have, how to do it, you must do it because this is not my planet, it's yours also. Hello? So whatever ideas you have, whatever you can do, you must do it. Don't tell me, huh? I'm sixty-five, huh? I must be retiring <laughs> And you are making this absolutely amazing journey and it's a big You must come, and see, my must come and see my motorcycle. You know, we got delayed. We got uh, delayed because of some misplacement of uh, keys and helmets and things like that because we just came from Berlin and as soon as we came, we went into uh, two different events. And uh, so it got misplaced and we couldn't find it. Then we got it late, we wanted to come here on time. So we broke a lot of rules in your city part of uh, our life. <laughs> because uh, in my life, this is the only crime I've committed, speed. <laughs> because speed is a way of crushing time, you know, sir? Next question, uh, somebody in behind, uh, volunteers are there with mics. Uh, Namaskaram, mm -hmm. <laughs> dear Sadhguruji, I'm so happy uh, to, s to see you, <laughs> to hear you. Uh, you are my big inspiration. I am a Bharatanatyam dancer. I'm dancing for him. I have just one question, please, because I don't know if I will see you again. But anyway, it's such a blessing. Why do you say I... that, huh? <laughs> can, you, <laughs> can you please… <laughs> can you please give me a blessing? Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. 
Next question. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, hello, Sadhguru. Are you? Okay. Ah. Thank you for this opportunity to hear your words. Uh, I want to ask you uh, about one question which is more related to soil and our planet, uh, because uh, what we can heard here is most, mostly about, uh, uh, let's say, physically, uh, substance of, of, uh, of our being. Uh, my question is, uh, do you also uh, feel some spiritual or energetical uh, connection with uh, the soul and our planet? Can you describe how, how do you feel it? You said soil, right? Yeah, yeah, soil and planet. See, uh, this universal... <laughs> let them, let them talk, it's okay, it's okay. Never stop the sounds of joy. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> see, uh, what we're talking about, consciousness, which is a limitless possibility, something that has no boundaries, in your mind it will not happen, okay? Because mind is a boundary by itself. You cannot think ever of something that is boundless because thought is a boundary by itself. Because thought is springing from a certain amount of data that we hold, which is a collection, which is a memory. Memory, as we went through, is always a boundary. So, you cannot grasp it. You can be excited about the idea, but you can never grasp it with the intellectual mind because that is not the nature of the intellectual mind. The intellectual mind is important to slice through things, to dissect, to glean things out of what is there, physical substances, not for consciousness, it's totally useless tool. It is like uh, where you need a spanner, you use a screwdriver, doesn't work, it's just like that. This is a tool made for a certain purpose, we have to use it for that. When we talk about soil, the important thing about soil is, it's as good as cosmos and consciousness because as far as human experience goes, see, we've already gone through this but let me repeat this. You, our nationalities, our race, religion, caste, creed, gender, all kinds of divisions, we've found hundreds of ways in which we can be different. But soil is a unifying force, it's a common factor. It's very, very important today. We were, you know, talking about endless number of wars going on, war after war. War is an economic process also for a whole lot of nations, all right? When this is the thing, finding a common factor among us is very important. Cosmic consciousness is a common factor, but where is it? How do I get it? It's far away. But at least with soil you understand, it is a common factor. Every one of us are made of this. Someday, you're a young man, so I don't want to say this, after many, many years, suppose you're also buried next to me in India, then you will know you being a Czech is no good. You will also merge with the same soil, just like me. Hello? Yes or no? Your nationality, your race, religion, gender, you think you're a woman, I think I'm a man. But if we are buried, we all become the same soil. So, this is a unifying factor. I don't want to stop this safe soil movement just as an ecological process. I want you to see this as a tremendous opportunity for humanity to come together like never before, at least on one aspect. So we have a time for last short question. Short question or short answer? Last short question and answer. <laughs> okay. You must tell me. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, somebody behind? Yeah, they decided. Mm. I got the mic, so. <laughs> Where are Hello. you? I'm, I'm here. I'm Clara, here from Prague. 
And uh, my question. So, whoever, is, whoever is the quickest draw, they get it. <laughs> Clara, where are you, Clara? Here. Okay. Nice uh, to see you. 11 o'clock. Yep. Uh, short answer for a question. How do we uh, take ourselves, the soil, life, seriously and lightly at the same time? See, uh, life is uh, just an amalgamation of situations, all sorts of situations. Some situations we like, some situations we don't like, some situations are pleasant, some situations are unpleasant. But it's all situations. It is you who title it as a problem. A certain situation, you'll title it as a problem, you'll name it as a problem, it is your problem. What is a problem for you? May not be a problem for somebody, isn't it? Any number of times you have seen, what is a big problem for you? Somebody seems to be enjoying that problem pretty well. So, do not… the reason why something becomes serious in your mind, See, situations may be extreme. Right now, this ecological situation is a bad situation. So if you become… go into a bad mood, will you solve the problem? So at any given time, if outside situations are not happening the way you want them to be, whether it is soil or war or home turf war, you know, whether it's in between two nations or within the family, or with the neighborhood, no matter what is happening, whatever the situation, if outside situations for some reason have become unpleasant, is it not extremely important you keep your inner situation very pleasant? Hello? What is the logic in this that if outside is unpleasant, I will also become unpleasant? So the only choice that you have in this world with life around you is just this. You can either be a part of the problem or part of the solution. There's simply no other choice. Looking for and imagining a world without any problem is a silly idea, it's childish. There is no such world ever. There never was, there never will be. There will be issues. Only thing is you should not be the issue. Hello? So, if… should I stop or… Yeah, if… if ten you, seconds. Okay. <laughs> okay, one minute. Okay. If you are not the issue, the issue that is around you, however complex that issue is, if you are not the issue, what can you do? You will do your best. In your life, if you do not do what you cannot do, there is no problem. If you do not do what you can do, you are a disaster, all right? Yes. So, I am repeating this for you because when you get angry, agitated, dead serious, tense, whatever you want to call it, some nonsensical experience of life that you are having within yourself and you think there is something wrong with life, no, your moods, your anxieties, your problems are essentially your intelligence turns against you. That's all it is. They're telling me there are seventy-two different types of mental ailments in the world. I'm telling you there's only one, that is your intelligence is turned against you. Your sharp knife is poking you. This is the only problem you have. If you know how to hold your knife, you will use it the way you must use it. If you don't know how to hold it, you will poke yourself or you poke somebody. So doesn't matter what is the situation, whatever the extreme situation it is, you being in a place where you are in a pleasant situation within yourself is most vital if you want to solve any problem in the world. Because if you become unpleasant, that means you are adding to the problem. 
you are nowhere, nowhere going to be a solution. Right now people's explanations will be, no but I got angry and I got this done. Yes, you can propel yourself into action with anger, with hatred. Hate has propelled people into all kinds of action. Jealousy has propelled people into all kinds of action. But is that the way to do it? Love also can propel you into action. Compassion can propel you into action. Blissfulness can propel you into action because once you're blissful by your own nature, you are no more a vested interest in the world, you will simply do what's needed. When you're in pursuit of happiness, you cannot do what is needed because you have to squeeze joy from the world. But once you're joyful by your own nature, not because of something, now you will do simply what is needed. If all of us do what is needed to the best of our abilities, will this world find solutions for everything? Dámy a pánové, Sadhguru, Karol Janeček, vy. A ještě zde máme speciální poděkování. It's a special present for Sadhguru right now from our beautiful girls. For me too. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Wow, thank you very much. Dámy a pánové, právě teď Během tohoto večera zmizelo 2000 fotbalových hřišť úrodné půdy. Prosím, je ten správný okamžik na to, abyste pomohli šířit tuto zprávu. It's very important to share this message from our guru. And I think... Can I say something, ma'am? Yes, please. So I'm giving you a 6% discount. That it was 100 days, now it's only 94 days. 94 days, don't think of me, don't worry about supporting me, you must talk soil in whichever way possible. All these phones that you're pointing at me, these are powerhouses. If you use them properly, one of you can reach the entire world, yes or no? Yes. These 94 days that you have, save soil, let's make it happen. Now it's a special moment for showing you beautiful video anatom of this soil movement, I would like to say. Evaporate across, across Czechoslovakia, okay? Také bychom chtěli poděkovat sponzoru dnešního večera a tím je Jan Čep, Kino 64. This very body is soil. My body, your body, everybody is just soil body. soil is, it turns death into life. Depleted soils will not quench the fire of hunger. Unquenched hunger can burn the very world. This is a generational responsibility. Save soil. Let's make it happen.
and when Sadhguru will do the picture with audience. So ladies and gentlemen, please hand Uh, one thing I want all of you to know is uh, already the Commonwealth nations which account for 54 nations on the planet amounting to 2.7 billion people are… have already declared that they will be a part of the Safe Soil Movement. Six… Six Caribbean nations have signed MOUs with us, another eight are in the process. Apart from that, I am addressing the COP15 where 170 nations are participating in Ivory Coast in the month of May. So by 9th, 10th of May when I am at Ivory Coast, by then you must get me at least 3 billion people saying yes to save soil, then 170 nations cannot ignore this, it will definitely happen, all right? Are we going to make it happen? That's it. Like,